There is a squad of feisty little squad of freshman representatives. They're very, very proud and very, very loud, these energetic progressives. They demand that power be shared with them by congressional leadership. They expound upon their reasons why to the loyal Twitter readership. Because everyone knows that the orange man bad. His tweets make all of the people mad. Impeachment hearings just must be had. That will make that feisty squad so glad. Yes, I'm talking about the squad of four, that tiny group of first-term congresswomen who have all of those controversial ideas and live to deliver tirades at the president and anyone else who tells them that their actions are beyond the pale. When criticized in response, they normally throw the bigotry flag as well. It's as if someone specifically crafted them in response to Donald Trump. Fighting fire with fire, if you will. Never mind that when one fights fire with fire, the normal result is that everyone gets burnt. Yeah, I think it's time for some roasted opinions, because I doubt that you tuned in for my original songwriting. I could launch right into a caustic listing of all of the faults and missteps by these four members of Congress and put together a scathing condemnation of them. It would actually be pretty easy to do this because none of the four seem to understand the way people behave in polite society nor what we as voters expect of our elected representatives. But then I would be remiss because Donald J. Trump is doing a great job of looking just as ridiculous as they are these days. This is the new character of political discourse. One side does his level best to identify all of those sore spots in the other side, and then hits every last one of them. Why? Because it provokes a huge overreaction. Then the side which prompted the overreaction can claim a grief status because the other side obviously overreacted, and then their supporters kick into overdrive defending what is oftentimes totally indefensible behavior. Case in point, Trump and the Squad. They're a perfect illustration of this disgusting phenomenon. The Squad is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ayanna Presley, Ilan Omar, and Rashida Tlaib. They are all progressives, all women of color, and all full of more energy than rational thought. They expect that since they managed to get a seat in Congress, they should be welcomed right into the leadership of Congress and resent the fact that career politicians like Nancy Pelosi are in charge. Not that I like Nancy Pelosi's policies in the least (coughs) Obamacare, (coughs) but she has more than a few years experience in Congress and enjoys the popular support of the majority in her party. I strongly believe in term limits for Congress, but she is a long-term member who knows how Washington works. (coughs) Sorry, saying that just left a really bad taste in my mouth, like I just ate a moth or something. Speaker Pelosi has been trying to manage the squad for quite a while now. At first, she let them have their head a little while she calmly but firmly reminded them that the Congressional Democrats have leaders who have been in there longer than Ocasio-Cortez has been alive. She tried to redirect them away from the bigger pitfalls in the public sphere, rather unsuccessfully. The squad, meanwhile, just keeps getting louder and louder, especially on Twitter. And then, this poll came out. That's right, folks. Those swing voters view the squad as the face of the Democrat Party, and they really don't like them that much. Like I said, Pelosi has been in the House of Representatives for a very, very long time. She knows from watching firsthand what happens when a small but vocal group of highly partisan new members become the face of their party with swing voters. About a decade ago, there were the Tea Party Republicans. And they certainly upset the GOP establishment for quite a while there. Normally, these groups disappear pretty quickly. They fade into the background as they assimilate into Washington politics as usual, or they keep on advocating themselves right out of office in pursuit of a political ideal which has never existed in America. If swing voters perceive the squad as the new face of Democrats, Speaker Pelosi will likely wind up House Minority Leader Pelosi in time for the 117th Congress. 
And if Trump would just let the squad keep acting like foul-mouthed, ill-informed idiots, well, the GOP would be assured of its majority, control of the White House for another four years, and a reasonably friendly federal judiciary. Trump can't do this, though, because he's Trump. I've spoken about how rude, bombastic, and inflammatory he is before. I've also mentioned the fact that he finds Twitter to be a valuable tool for communicating directly with the American people, and that by using it the way that he does, he speaks without any filtration whatsoever, which lets everyone see tweets like this. Oh, come on, Mr. President. Why? Did you really have to feed right into the squad's hands like that with a tweet perfectly designed to let them cry racism, sexism, and all the other isms and phobias? Um, no. Just, no. You pitched them a perfect strike, and they just launched it past the nosebleed seats and into the parking lot. Oh, I'm sorry, dear viewer. You don't watch baseball? Okay, then. This is an own goal with the penalty thrown in for good measure. All those supporters of the World Cup champion U.S. women's team who tune into my channel should catch that reference. Wait, what? Rapido fans don't watch my channel? Oh, well. Now, I've defended Trump a lot on this channel. I still think that between him and Hillary, he was the better choice. His economic policies are working for the most part, although there's been quite a bit of pain for major exporters like the corn and soybean growers from the neighborhood where I grew up. With a little more care and a little less diatribe, Trump might just manage to end the tech transfers and other trade issues which the Western world has with China and boost GDP growth everywhere. He might also get a lot more needed reforms through Congress like reducing unnecessary regulations and simplifying the tax codes and even getting the healthcare industry to stop maximizing profits at the expense of patients who just can't afford for the price of their medications to go up 700%. He might even get the manufacturing sector all the way back in action, too. Although that's a long, hard road to hoe, given the decades of benign neglect shown our manufacturing interests by so many past presidents. He's really not doing such a bad job of running the country. But when he tweets out crapola like this, he confirms exactly what so many liberals say about him in the minds of so many potential voters. After all, if one suspects that Trump is a racist and Trump says something which sounds racist, then the logical conclusion is that Trump's racism is confirmed, isn't it? If one suspects sexism and tweet, here's Trump saying something that sounds sexist, then it's no great step to believe that Trump is sexist. Repeat for whatever ism or phobia you choose. And that just feeds into the concentration camp Russian puppet narrative about Trump which the legacy media feeds on, doesn't it? It's all as vacuous as a flame war between elected officials on social media, but how many people who don't bother to educate themselves at all will accept these accusations as fact? How many who do educate themselves but don't bother to check their sources out first will buy into this narrative. Even the best and brightest are falling into the cycle of defending one group of idiots every time and defaming the other group of idiots just as often. Not a constructive way to spend our time at all. Perhaps a little less tweeting and a little more, we're this far apart on this issue. Let's figure out how to bridge that gap and get something done to solve the problem. That might at least sound like everyone's doing their job. Now, there is a big plus to Trump and the squad tweeting out their relentless streams of bilge water. The legacy media keeps gobbling this up and regurgitating it for ratings and circulation, which they desperately need in order to stay relevant and financially secure. We know that outlets like CNN are beginning to suffer financially, so much so that they are attempting to force out independent channels like this one on YouTube in order to maintain their revenues. If Trump and the squad stopped feeding them, then they might just discover that they don't know how to find real newsworthy subjects and produce decent content. All that they have is high production values. Their content is repackaged tripe. They are failing. And everyone knows that they are failing. And that is eventually going to leave them in bankruptcy court, desperately trying to restructure their organizational model to rebuild their audiences and their advertising income. If so, then they will know what it's like for independent creators struggling to keep their channels afloat without audiences or income. That would certainly get their attention, wouldn't it? But I digress. Oh, and I did notice that there were some major real news stories, like the fact that Trump suspended asylum for Central Americans who passed through Mexico, 
and the legacy media missed that story entirely. I suppose that I should thank Trump and the squad for that, because independent channels on YouTube are covering that story. It's the real story of the news cycle, and almost all of the legacy media missed it. But my advice to both Trump and the squad regarding social media is going to have to remain, stop feeding the monster. The first side which starts executing some discipline on Twitter will probably win the next election. Will it be Trump? Will it be the squad? Or will neither of them think for a minute before they push the little button marked tweet? My guess is that nothing will change. And because nothing will change, we're going to see Trump re-elected in 2020. We may also see the squad become not first-term congresswomen, but one-term congresswomen.